Good morning. This is our time of worship at the Benefice Classic Service. This is Advent Sunday, one of the most important days in the church calendar. Our thoughts look back in remembrance as we prepare again to celebrate God coming to be with us at Christmas time. And we also look forward to Christ's coming in glory, fulfilling God's loving purposes for humanity. Our hope very much is that whilst we can't physically worship together here, you will find that in spirit you can share with us in this service of words and music. We're delighted that Bishop Michael Bourne will be speaking to us shortly in a pre-recorded sermon. Reflective music is woven throughout this service of worship and will hopefully bring you a real sense of both the comfort and the joy that is the promise of this coming Christmas season. And so we shall begin by lighting the first of our Advent candles and a verse in the quiet as that happens. You too be patient and stand firm because the Lord is coming near. And now, our opening words for Advent. O oh Lord, open our lips, and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. Reveal among us the light of your presence, that we may behold your power and glory. In a moment, our musicians are going to play and sing a chant that was written for worship in the Teze community, but it is based on the very ancient words of Psalm 104. Those words are, Bless the Lord my soul, and bless his holy name. Bless the Lord my soul, who leads me into life. These beautiful words will form a thread through today's worship. And so as we move towards our time of confession, you're invited to listen and or join in. to our time of confession. Jesus says, repent, for the kingdom of God is close at hand. So let us turn away from our sin and turn to Christ, confessing our sins in penitence and in faith. Lord God, 
We have sinned against you. We have done evil in your sight. We are sorry and repent. Have mercy on us according to your love. Wash away our wrongdoing and cleanse us from our sin. Renew a right spirit within us and restore us to the joy of your salvation. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. May the Father of all mercies cleanse us from our sins and restore us in his image to the praise and glory of his name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now our hymn, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. This is an Advent hymn which has its roots in monastic life, and these words have, in much this form, been sung during Advent for over a thousand years.
our reading this morning is from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 to 9. And Bishop Michael will be reading this passage in the recording which follows, and we shall then hear the message he's been moved to preach on the platform. The reading for this uh, Advent service is from the beginning of 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 1, and here it comes. For in him you have been enriched in every way, with all kinds of speech and with all knowledge, God thus confirming our testimony about Christ among you. Therefore, therefore, you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly await for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. He will also keep you firm to the end, so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, who has called you into fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Well, a very good morning on this Advent Sunday. Advent's always a bit of a puzzle, isn't it? Because uh, it, it starts with the second coming and then moves on to the first coming, which seems the wrong way round. Uh, really, this Sunday ought to be the end of the Christian year rather than the beginning of it, and then we could uh, have a great celebration of worship and expectation and thanksgiving and make it a really special day. It is, after all, the finale, the greatest finale of all history, the eternal plan of God coming together, uh, the great time with the whole family of God saved by the shed blood of Christ, will be gathered forever in the new heaven and the new earth. So uh, I uh, think perhaps we ought to be having special thanksgiving and even dancing in the aisles with the joy of this day. We declare in the creed that we believe that Jesus will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and uh, his kingdom will have no end. Do you know, that's very easy, isn't it, to say it? We might say it here in church endless numbers of times. But do we really believe it? Uh, and certainly we don't, I think, feature it in our thinking as much as we ought to. But there it is, part of the creed. And if you had been in the uh, cotton fields as a, as a slave in those dreadful days, and then you started to sing, what did you sing? Well, one of the great songs that you sang was... Uh, the, the words always kind of emerge from one. My Lord, what a morning when the stars begin to fall. Or again, sweet chariot, swing low, sweet chariot, coming to carry me home. The thought of the Lord coming, the thought of the Lord having the final word was something to cheer them in the desperate state in which they were. So for our own lives, this is an important day. So what's going to happen? Well, uh, in uh, Mark 13, Jesus said, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give light, the stars will fall from the sky, and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, he says, people will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory, and he will send his angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heavens. Wow. So that's the description that he gave, and it's going to be some day. I don't know whether you react to that with some sort of fear, and if it was going to happen tomorrow morning, whether you fear I would run underneath the table, whereas really what we should do is run out into the street to greet him, because the great thing is not what's happening to the heavens and the earth, it's what's happening that Jesus, the Lord himself, will come and appear before us and gather the whole of his family. What a day it's going to be. The Thessalonians had a bit of a problem about it all. They, they really longed for the second coming, even in Paul's day. And uh, they got a bit worried because they said, hey, some of our number have died. They're going to miss out on this big event. And Paul says, well, they won't miss out because when the Lord comes, he's going to be bringing the elect, all those who've died in Christ, he will be bringing them with him. And then there will be this great union as those on earth and those coming with him gather. And you say, well, how could that possibly be? Just think of the universe as enormous. And in that 
universe that God has made, this great reunion will take place. Every eye will see him, says Revelation 1, in this glorious moment. So uh, Paul writes it like this. The Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. Wow, what a day. And uh, Paul goes on to say, therefore, comfort one another with these words. We're supposed to be on comfort and joy. And boy, one of the comforting is that the Lord has the on-off switch. The Lord has control. Whatever we do on this earth, rather like on the television screen, he has the on-off switch, and that's when it will happen, whenever that will be. It could be in another thousand years. It could be on Wednesday. Who knows? It's going to happen, and it is going to be the finale. And that's a, a wonderful thing that we can look forward to together. And the amazing thing is that this is going to be true, of course, if we die in the normal way. Again, we shall meet with the Lord and be one of those who will come in the great gathering uh, on that particular day. So we'll experience it one way or the other, which will be terrific. And when you compare that with the desperate sadness of those who have no belief in God, remember the dreadful things that people like Bertrand Russell said. He said on one occasion, brief and powerless is man's life, on him and all his race, the slow, sure doom falls, pitiless and dark. Compare that with the living hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. But then Peter takes it further in 2 Peter 3. He describes, again, the, the end of time, the, the end of the world, the, the burning up of the world. Uh, but he says something wonderful. He says, but in keeping with his promise, we look forward to the new heavens and the new earth. This had been predicted long back, where righteousness dwells. So in point of fact, this great finale is a premiere, a premiere for all that God has prepared for those that love him. And it's going to be absolutely terrific. Uh, beyond our em uh, imagination. Uh, Revelation 21, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. What will it be like? Well, we'll have resurrection bodies, so, and there won't be uh, normal relationships in other ways, although we will know each other, and there will be much love, I think. As far as we can discern all that, it will be wonderful. It will be without tears, without death, and the Lord will be at the centre of it all. It's absolutely mind-blowing. But we can't know much more. Martin Luther said, we can know, know no more what it's going to be like than the baby in the mother's womb knows what life is going to be like. It's not going to be simply beyond our understanding. But it's got to be better than anything we've known already on this earth and heavens in which we live. So as we rejoice in these uh, great truths, uh, we then um, go on to ask ourselves, what does that mean as far as we're concerned? And nearly all the references in the New Testament to the second coming um, come with the added thing of what does it mean to you? What difference is it going to make to your life? How are you going to live? You're going to be preparing for this great event. Uh, and uh, I remember when I was in Nottingham as a curate, in my first curacy, there was a, a dear man living in his little house. Uh, he was a widower. And when I went to visit him, his house was as tidy. There was not a thing wrong with it at all. And I said, how very lovely you keep your house. He said, yes, because the Lord may come tonight and I want it to be ready for him. Well, we may not all tidy our houses with the thought of the second coming, but we need to tidy our lives. And that's what it's all about. And so uh, the, 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 the Lord tells us things like the parable of the wise and foolish virgins, you remember, those who had oil in the lamp and those who didn't, which means that those whose spirituality had faded <coughs> instead of being ready for his coming, and they're caught out when he comes. Or he told the parable of the stewards and the talents and the Lord coming and those who had, had done good with their talents and the one who'd failed. Be ready because the master of the house may come at any time. <clears throat> and different stories like this 
press home the point, are we ready? Paul uses in uh, Ephesians the picture of our being the bride of Christ and we're preparing, as it were, for the wedding. And he wants his bride to be holy and blemish, uh, without blemish and a perfect person. And thus Paul comes back to say, clean your hearts, prepare your hearts, think more into the Lord and, and all that he is. You ought to live holy and godly lives, says Peter. Um, and it's going to be very, very exciting uh, as we prepare. One of the phrases that comes actually in the Mark uh, passage is this, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. And just let that hit you. The most precious thing that you'll ever take from this earth is the word of God in your heart, in your life, lived out and worked out. This is what matters more than anything else. We spend our time on this and that and all sorts of other things. But the most important thing is to deepen in the word and to live it out in our lives. It's a wonderful privilege to be a Christian and to be part of the whole family of God already by faith. But what lies ahead um, is so wonderful. Um, we are to be people who will run out with love to greet him when he comes. It will be the greatest wonder if we're here. And if we're amongst that great gathering, it will be a terrific joy to be there. So may God challenge us in our own lives. May we be people who go out and touch others in his name. Those who long to be more what he wants us to be, so that we may not be ashamed on the day of his coming. Let this day be a day of expectancy and encouragement, a day of challenge, but a day of comfort and joy. So just one further thought, remember that it's all about Christ and his coming, not about the events around it. And they keep our eyes on that. And one of the great hymns of the second coming was one that was sent to me by Timothy Dudley Smith some years ago when I was doing a lot of hymn writing, uh, music uh, writing. And um, this was when the Lord in glory comes. It's so exciting, not the trumpet, not the drums, etc., etc. But what it ends up with at the end of the verses is, for instance, but his voice when he appears will be music to my ears. Or again, but it is to whom I fall, Jesus Christ my all in all. In other words, when you think of the second coming, it's all about Christ. And if you'd like to hear it, tune in. It's on YouTube. Just put in, when the Lord in glory comes, it'll come up with the full orchestra. phrases that you really heard in that tidy up your life is what I heard but just a moment or two to reflect We come now to our time of prayer. We're going to begin and close that time with the Tezo chant sung through twice. During the intercessions, there will be pauses between each prayer, but we will close each section with the Advent response. And that is, Lord revealed in the world, hear our prayer.
rise to the life immortal. Through him who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever.
the notices for today. Our services will remain online for the next two Sundays, that's the 6th and the 13th of December. But on the 20th of December, we have churchyard carols at both churches, so numbers will be a little less limited. There's lots of information on the website about a whole range of amazing and uh, uh, wonderful activities, particularly the daily Advent reflections, which will be starting today. So do look at those. Now for our closing prayer. Saviour eternal, life of the world unfailing, light everlasting and our true redemption. Taking our humanity in your loving freedom, you rescued our lost earth and filled the earth with joy. By your first advent, justify us. By your second, set us free. That when the great light dawns and you come as judge of all, we may be robed in immortality and ready, Lord, to follow in your footsteps, blessed wherever they may lead us. And some final words of sending out. May the Lord, when he comes, find us watching and waiting. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Comfort, O oh comfort, my people, says your God.